stealth technology, the internet, GPS in the palm of your hand, autonomous operation. Technology is a driver of our times. Since its founding in 1958 in the midst of the Cold War, DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, has been a driver of technology. Welcome to Voices from DARPA, a window onto DARPA's core of program managers. Their job, to redefine what is possible. My name is Ivan Amato, and I am your DARPA host. Today I am pleased to have with me in the studio Dev Palmer, a program manager in DARPA's Microsystems Technology Office. Since 2012, he has been in that office overseeing a portfolio of projects, all of them with the goal of pushing electronics into smaller, faster, and generally more capable territory. So welcome, Dev, to Voices from DARPA. Thank you, Ivan. Dev, I'd like to start uh, by just finding out a little bit about you. And uh, so maybe you can tell us something about your background and interests and how you became a program manager at DARPA. Well, like every uh, red-blooded American teenage boy, I started playing electric guitar. Back then, you played through an amplifier that used vacuum tubes. And there was some cachet with the soft glow of the vacuum tubes and the warm sound that you get when you play your guitar through them. But uh, being naturally curious, I started to wonder how they worked and how does the guitar take the motion of the strings and turn it into an electric signal. That led me into studying electromagnetics. I ended up pursuing engineering, electrical engineering as a career and started working as a government program manager for the Army Research Office about 15 years ago uh, until I ended up here. Let's talk a little bit about some of the programs then since uh, 2012 that you have been overseeing. Uh, and I'm thinking perhaps we can start with the uh, terahertz electronics program. And I'm going to sort of steal your thunder slightly here by telling our listeners that in 2014 it garnered a Guinness World Record. But I'm going to let you talk about the program and, and what that uh, superlative moment was when you, uh, you heard about that record. That was a lot of fun indeed. Uh, you can think about transistors like you think about guitar strings. The low-frequency guitar strings can be heavy and loose, but as you move up in frequency, the strings get thinner and you have to wind them tighter. It's kind of the same with transistors. When you're working at low frequencies, you can get away with large dimensions, and as you move up in frequency, those dimensions have to shrink. So in the terahertz electronics program, we really took that to an extreme. It's like when you put new strings on your guitar and you're tuning it up and you're winding the strings tighter and tighter. You think they can't get any tighter and they're about to break, but you still keep winding and finally you hit the note you want. It worked kind of the same way in the terahertz electronics program. So, so Deb, let me just st stop you a little bit before you say more about the program. Uh, because I don't, I'm not sure all of our listeners would have heard the term terahertz. Now, I know the A above middle C on a guitar <laughs> vibrates at 440 hertz. That's 440 vibrations per second. Tell us what one terahertz is in comparison to that. Uh, one terahertz is 10 to the 12th vibrations per second, which is 1, 000, 000, 000, 000, 000, 000, 000, 000, 000, 000, 000, 000 cycles per second. That's one trillion. That's correct. One trillion cycles per second. So that's very hard to achieve in an electronic circuit, right? Yes, very hard. In fact, uh, when the program started, none of the performers believed it could be done. And during the program, there were many instances when uh, we were thinking that maybe we should just circle the wagons and try to make the electronics work, work better at a lower frequency. But one of my colleagues, Bruce Wallace, said that uh, Chuck Yeager didn't get famous for flying 85% of the speed of sound. So if we were going to have a terahertz electronics program, we were going to have electronics that worked at one terahertz. So everybody found uh, new knobs to twist and kept working on it, and finally we did hit that mark. Right, okay, and, and at that time, that was, and perhaps it is now, you can let me know what the status is, but it, it actually was the fastest switching electronic circuit on the planet. It's the fastest linear amplifier on the planet at the time, and still is, and I imagine it will be for some time to come. Okay, so it, it took you, uh, you know, you had to inspire your performers, those uh, groups that worked on this to, uh, to actually achieve this. 
Uh, you went through great pains to do this. Uh, why? What, what, what do you get by having a terahertz switch? There's two things you get from moving transistor performance up in frequency. One is you access much wider bandwidths, which is like having a bigger pipe to push your data through in a communication system. And the other is, if you work on a transistor enough to, to make it capable of working at a terahertz, you have to eliminate all the parasitic capacitances, resistances, inductances that limit its performance. And then when you take that same transistor and operate down at lower frequencies, say in the millimeter wave, the performance of the transistor is much better. You get lower noise, better linearity, better dynamic range, and maybe most importantly, better power efficiency. Interesting. So you get this circuitry that, that uh, can switch at, at terahertz uh, that then has uh, additional benefits uh, just because you've pushed the technology forward and you can apply it elsewhere in the electronic space. Exactly. Right. So let's let's move to another program that uh, I guess really gets back to what we were talking about before, which is uh, vacuum electronics. This one is called INVEST, and that stands for Innovative Vacuum Electronics Science and Technology Program. So I'd love you to tell us a little bit about uh, the origin of that program, what problems and, or what technologies it's, uh, it is designed to create, and what its status is at the moment. Terahertz Electronics Program pushed solid-state electronics up to an extremely high frequency. But if you're trying to get extremely high frequency and extremely high power at the same time, vacuum tubes are pretty much your only option. The problem is that vacuum tubes scale with operating frequency, the dimensions get smaller and smaller as you go up in frequency, and so at some point you just can't build them. So the INVEST program is exploring uh, several different areas. One is advanced manufacturing, for example, using 3D printing, additive manufacturing. The vision there is to be able to draw the tube in a CAD program, ship the CAD file to the printer, and end, it, end up with a millimeter wave tube voila, right out of the machine. Right, so com com CAD being a computer-aided design. Uh, and, and the idea here then is you have to make the cavities in which uh, sort of the, the, the frequency generation is, is occurring really small, smaller uh, than ever before for the frequencies you're interested in here, yeah. The cavity dimensions get smaller and the alignment requirements get more critical. So if you could build the whole tube at once, you'd have the dimensions and the alignment in one shot. There's another thrust in the program that's looking at modeling because as you move up in frequency, small variations in the manufacturing process can produce large variations in device performance. And you'd like to be able to know which of the dimensional parameters is most important. So you need a modeling program to do that. Then there are other components of the tube, the cathode and the beam wave interaction structure where we just went out looking for new and interesting ideas, maybe that would just blow away the current way of building tubes and eliminate the uh, problem with manufacturing altogether. Okay, so let's say the program uh, ends up being successful, and why shouldn't we think otherwise? Uh, so you end up having a new kind of family of technologies where you've got this high frequency and you've got the high power. Where do you imagine these technologies uh, finding an important place? So you hear a lot about 5G as the next generation of cell phone communications. They're talking about using frequencies that are in the millimeter wave region of the spectrum, but still hard to get devices that operate in that range, especially with enough power to close a communications link over a long distance. So that's where the INVEST program comes in. You get millimeter wave operation and high power in an affordable, power-efficient device. And again, using your pipe metaphor, which I really like, you have, you'll, we'll have bigger pipes on, connecting our cell phones to the system with this technology that might come out of uh, the INVEST program. Yes, absolutely. Uh, you're not going to find a vacuum tube in your handset, I'm pretty sure, but it could see some use in base stations and definitely in military communication systems. All right, and so let's talk about just one more program. I know this is one of your latest, uh, which is a mouthful to say. I, one of the short forms I like is M cubic. If you actually write that out, that's M three I C. But the real long form, I'll say it. Uh, it'll take two seconds or three. Magnetic miniaturized and monolithically integrated components program. Did I actually say that right, Dev? 
Yes, that's exactly All correct. All right, so I feel like I've accomplished something. Okay, well, the primary goal of the program is to be able to integrate magnetic materials with the semiconductor devices that everybody knows and loves today. Uh, if you dive a little deeper into it, we've achieved an incredible degree of integration of electronic components like resistors, transistors, and capacitors, largely because you have a large palette of materials to work with that have properties that are relevant to electronic components. With magnetic components, there are only three elements that have intrinsic magnetic properties. So it's been very difficult to, to find a way to integrate those with semiconductor processes. What we're trying to do with the program is leverage some work that's been done in material science on magnetic materials over the last decade or so with microwave engineering to produce integrated components where you can actually access that magnetic physics in an electronic circuit in a very compact form factor. So let me ask you this, because I'm already amazed by the chips in our lives, right? They can do so many things. They have, uh, there's part of so many technologies. What more are you going to get by, by taking ma small magnetic components now and integrating them into those, uh, those ubiquitous chips? From the user point of view, you probably won't see anything much different. But from the technologist's point of view, lower frequency systems use magnetic components all the time. But they're large and heavy and tend to be difficult to integrate. So you kind of push that functionality out to the edges of the circuits and use it in a non-ideal way. So give me an and example so, or two, though, of a specific technology where these magnetic components are central to it, even though they're not yet integrated onto the chips themselves, but they're somehow in the overall system. So what might be an overall system that, again, has the electronics in it and some of these magnetic components we're talking about? Well, picture a walkie-talkie, for example. You've got a transmitter and a receiver, but you've only got one antenna. There's a magnetic component that isolates the transmitter from the receiver and connects both of them to the antenna at the same time. Uh, if you didn't have that, you'd have to have two antennas. Now, up at higher frequencies, you can still do that, but the performance of the components drops off substantially because they're separate from the electronics. What we're hoping to do with MCubic is bring that functionality back into interaction with the electronic circuit so you can have that same kind of uh, ease of operation up at the higher frequencies. Right now, you have to try to mimic that magnetic physics with electronic components, and there's really nothing that does quite the same job. Right. And for those uh, engineer types out there who are listening, I, I think the component you were referring to just now is that known as a circulator? Wow, Ivan, that's great. Yes, it is. Yeah. yeah. Just, I just impressed you, Dev. And just, you mentioned three components. We're not going to talk about them, but I'm just now intrigued by what they are. So a circulator is one of them, and what are the other two? Well, in the program, we're looking at frequency selective limiter, which can, through the natural physical process, cancel out interfering signals, whether they're intentional or not. And also at uh, integrated inductors, which have been kind of a holy grail for millimeter wave circuits for a long time. And just give me one reason why uh, they've been so coveted. Well, right now, since you don't have access to magnetic materials on chip, the inductors tend to take up a substantial percentage of the circuit board space. If you have a magnetic material, you can shrink those down substantially, make the whole chip smaller. That means it works better and it's also cheaper. But can, can you say in a sentence or two what function the inductor typically has? Uh, the inductor smooths out high frequency signals. It tends to pass lower frequency signals and stops higher frequency signals. So. At very low frequencies, they're used to filter power supplies, make nice, quiet power supplies. At higher frequencies, they're used as part of filter circuits to select out the frequencies you want and the frequencies you don't want. So thanks you know, for talking about all of those uh, programs. There are others that you uh, are also overseeing, but we're not going to talk about all of them now. But what I would like to talk about is these programs and you as a program manager in a place like DARPA. And what I'm getting at here is, uh, you know, DARPA is, is just part of the, the overall innovation 
ecosystem. Uh, you've been here since 2012. You, you've got these programs we've talked about. So, you know, what is it like to be here? And, and how do you think DARPA is unique in the innovation uh, ecosystem? Coming to DARPA is like grabbing the nose cone of a rocket and holding on for dear life. <laughs> uh, it's a fast moving place that has a significant impact on the trajectory of, of technology for the nation. And being part of that is an incredible thrill. The idea that you can come up with a technical idea that's interesting to you and create a community to pursue that idea is, is an experience you won't get anywhere else. You can take flyer bets on crazy things like integrating magnetics with semiconductors, and people will actually soldier up and tell you how they're going to do it. Right. So, so what you just said about creating communities is just uh, something that, that uh, you know, I, I guess I've observed here, too, in the short time I've been here. Uh, and I think maybe perhaps one of the most valuable things that happens here at DARPA, which is, is, is that you, uh, the program managers, do bring together handfuls of, of uh, research groups that otherwise probably would not have gotten together, but in getting together now create uh, uh, and bring, bring together mindsets, skill sets, tool sets, ways of doing, ways of thinking that are unique and, and therefore can push into new technological territory. Did I overstate things or is that about kind of right? No, that's about right. It's very exciting. Can you name one science fiction technology that you just wish could become real? Well, I haven't, since I commute weekly between DARPA and my home in North Carolina, that would be teleportation, of course. But I don't think we'll ever get there. We don't have any wireless communication technology that can transfer the amount of information it would take to completely disassemble and reconstruct a human in any reasonable amount of time. Imagine having to encode the information that's in every strand of DNA in every cell of your body, every memory you've ever had, every scene you've ever seen. Take that apart, turn it into bits, send it somewhere, and then rebuild it in the physical world driving might be faster. Well, Deb, I do hope that teleportation does become a reality at some point in the future, at the very least, to make your commuting and traveling around a little bit easier. Uh, I've really enjoyed the entire conversation, Deb, and I just want to thank you for coming into the studio. Thank you, Ivan. It's been a real pleasure. And thanks, listeners, for sharing this time with us. I hope you join us again for the next Voices from DARPA. To find this and other episodes of Voices from DARPA, visit us online at darpa.mil.